Thank you for the opportunity we have. You know, I always never take it for granted. I probably have less opportunities now than I did earlier in life. So every opportunity that I have, I take seriously. And, I, and Lord, I just ask you to move mightily to teach us some things that we need to know. In Jesus' name, amen. And I pray, Father, for all those that will be watching this later, that they will watch it and learn so much in Jesus' name. Somebody asked me, so what's going on in your life and ministry at this particular time? I said, basically, I'm preparing a next generation. That's really my focus. That's pretty much it. I mean, we do still do the crusades and all that, but I'm, I'm preparing another generation through the Internet you know, and, and through media so that uh, they can take it and run with it. And uh, some of us, you know, who have experience can lay down whatever we know. Hallelujah. I'm not saying I'm going anywhere. I'm just saying that's basically my focus. And I think that's a lot of people's focus. You know, one of the things that we're going through some difficult and challenging times in America. And uh, but one of the things that come out of this, I think the greatest thing is, is the way people, leaders are coming together. Leaders that never used to even hang out or know each other now are coming together. I think that we see that some, that's because of the issue. Like if you go to, uh, you know, Panama because of their government was not always great. There's a lot of unity there, you know. You go to, you go to uh, some certain uh, countries, they don't think like we do. They don't care about denominations. It's not like the, you know, well, what are you or what are you? We're just, we come together because it's, it's difficult and challenging. And it always has been. And so, like in Reno, the same way, we kind of dropped off our issues and got together because you know, of the pressures and stuff of, of life concerning uh, Christianity. So that's kind of a good thing. Amen. Now, this is December. I got December 18th. That can't be right. Hang on one second. Well, this is December 12th, right? Now, next week, we won't be here. Is that, where's Melissa? Okay, well, I'm glad you'll be here. I don't know if I will be. Let me make sure I'm doing the right thing here because... <laughs> Hallelujah. That's for tomorrow. Oh, boy. Ooh. How many of these have I done? I've done two of these. Okay, this is the third one. Well, I just put the date down wrong. So, anyway, I guess we'll be here next week. The, and then the week after, and the week after that, we're taking off for Saturday, just so everybody knows, you know, who cares? Nobody probably, but whatever. <laughs> so this is our third session. This is our third session in leadership, okay, on the leadership thing. So last week we did what? We talked about what? Okay, see, there you go. Servanthood. The foundation of, of a good leader is what? Learning to be a servant. And we're going to talk about, uh, yeah, he enjoyed that. He bony, finger, bony fingered prophets like this. <laughs> Go to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to talk about that again, but we're going to add to it. All right, because it's a very, very important subject. So in Matthew chapter 24, if I wrote it down right, which is always a concern nowadays, and we go down to verse, <clears throat> boy. That can't be right. 30, 36. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's start off, say, I would say probably about verse 42 or so. Now, Jesus talked a lot about the end times. And, and inside that teaching of, on the end times, there's a lot of stuff about leadership. A lot of stuff about discipleship and Christianity that is really dynamic and awesome. And I've always liked Matthew chapter 24 a lot. You know, it's one of my favorite chapters. Probably if I had to pick one, that would be the, the best one I like in the Gospels. Because I'm, it's just the times we're living in and stuff. So if you go down here to verse... Uh, now see, if, if, if you read the rest of Matthew chapter 24, it talks about, uh, you know... Jesus coming back, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm not really doing an eschatology thing here. 
But in verse 42, it says, and my, the headline on my Bible says, faithful and unfaithful servants. Everybody say faithful, faithful. and unfaithful, unfaithful. Servants. servants. Don't let that pass you by. So some people cross over into the servant stage, but they're not faithful. They're unfaithful or they become unfaithful. So even though we, we cross over into this servant stage, doesn't mean that's the bottom line. Amen. And so he's going to go on and talk about that. So starting in verse 42, watch, therefore, everybody say watch, watch. for, you know, not what hour your Lord does come. Now everybody can say, well, I hope he comes back tomorrow. I hope he comes back next week. Do you think he's going to come back, Pastor Tom? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, they thought he was coming back in Paul's day. And certainly we're getting closer. But if somebody asked me right now what I thought about it, I'd say probably 100 years from now. Because there's a lot to do. But if it wasn't and it was today, I certainly wouldn't be upset about it. And neither would you, right? And all that. But um, just live like he's coming back every day. That's all he can do. Verse 43. But know this. Everybody say know this. Okay, here's that word know that's so interesting in the Bible that talks about making sure you understand something. Okay, you have an intimate knowledge about it. But know this, this that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken in. So Jesus used the illustration of, of, of a guy out here that was, was not watching, wasn't diligent. He was inside sleeping, you know, and uh, his house got broken into. And what he's trying to tell us is that even though we have received the Lord, even though we have decided to become servants, we've made that decision, disciples and servants, we still have to watch because the devil is always going to try to get in and we need to be diligent right. not to let him in. Amen. Yeah. So this is why the heading says here, it says faithful and unfaithful servants. You can be a servant, but be unfaithful. So when we cross the jo the, the, that, that servanthood thing, which is not a whole lot in the, in the church, world, you still got this, this thing hanging over your head of you got to be a faithful servant. And God requires, he wants us to be faithful servants. It's very important to him. Amen. All right. So uh, verse 44, therefore, or because of the fact of what he just said, be ye also ready. Everybody say ready. ready. For in such an hour as you think not the son of man cometh. Now, he uses that, that language several times, and it's interesting. He says, you know, kind of like when God comes on the scene, you know, the children of Israel, there, were, there was an illustration on there this morning about the, the selection thing, and the children of Israel up against the Red Sea. Yeah. And they were not expecting anything. They were expecting death, a lot of them. And they were complaining, oh, you brought us out here to die, and, you know, that's how they were. Yeah. And Moses said, shut up. He, you know, Moses actually said, Stand back, get back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, God splits his sea open. Yeah. And it was like, wow. Yeah. They weren't expecting that. No. You know, and right now it's the same thing with the elections. Yeah. I stopped trying to figure out how that's going to happen because in the because my, my mind, I sit there and go. Well, what about this? And I was telling Jay, what, what happened to this? But you know, the truth of the matter of it, I think we're going to have a Red Sea moment where God gets all the glory. Hallelujah. But you know, the thing about it is, I don't know how God does things. In fact, we're going to have to learn how to trust him. And I think that, I think a lot of this is, is proving the body of Christ. And, and we're finding out what, what that 90% of them are wimps. They don't believe anything. They, 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 can't, they can't hang in there. Yeah. And you got to learn how to hang in there. But he says, look, you got to watch. He says, you got to, you know, keep diligent, right? Because you don't know when, when, the, when the Lord's coming back, right? So anyway, verse 45. Who then is a what? Faithful. Everybody say faithful. faithful. 
and what? Why? Ooh, two things. Two very important things. Who then is not just a faithful, but a wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give him meat in due season. Now here we got some meat, meaty word, because we got not just a servant here, we got a faithful servant and we got a what? A wise servant. These are important words, powerful words. The Bible says in, in one book of the Bible, I think it's uh, Proverbs, a faithful man who can, can find. You know, it's, it's hard to find a faithful person. So it's really interesting because people don't think about it in these terms. But when we get to heaven, we're going to have different rewards. Some folks won't get hardly anything. They'll be glad they're there. They'll get a nice house. But for, all, for those people that have been faithful and true and wise and diligent, there's going to be some interesting things. That's only, it's only righteous. That's only justice. It's right. yeah. just like people go to hell. Some of them will be at a certain level. Other ones will be a worse level. You can't mislead God's people. No one's knowing you shouldn't and think that, you know, you're not going to be treated worse. They're going to be treated worse. Come on. That's justice. That's justice. So here we have this word. Now, who then is a faithful and wise servant or leader? Instead of servant, let's just put the word leader because that's what we're talking about. And the foundation of leadership, as far as God's concerned, is servanthood. Now, I know this is not going to be a top 20 seller if I wrote a book about it. Why don't you motivate, Pastor Tom? Motivate, motivate. Well, I'm trying to from God's perspective. Yeah. Which is very difficult because if you say anything different than the rest of the people, the rest of the crowd, then you just don't fit in. And I don't fit into the crowd anymore. I kind of went out of the crowd a while ago, decided to do, do what was right. And <laughs> he says, not just a wise, but a faithful. Not just a faithful, but a wise. Now, the word servant. How many know our lives are not our own? First thing you need to know at, when you're a Christian and you've come to the Lord is your life is not your own. You are bought with a price. God, covenant means he does this for us, but we need to do stuff for him. And he, he wants us to be vessels that he can use. And it's hard for people. It's a process going through that and learning about it. And I'm not saying God is going to bang you over the head if you don't learn it right off because it takes a while. But as you go through the process, it gets to the point to where... You understand that the foundational thing about leadership is learning to be a servant, which means a bond slave, a deacon, a minister, right? You're doing all, you, we explained that last week, and he told the Pharisees and the scribes that were standing in all these great places that they were a bunch of vipers, and they did it the wrong way, and they weren't servants, and it was not good. Woe unto you, woe unto you. Yeah. So you got to cross that bridge. And then he says, you got to learn how to be faithful. Everybody say faithful. faithful. Now, the Greek word. I went back and looked at this. Interesting. Because it's not what I thought it was. The word really means worthy to believe, be believed. In other words, you can have a friend and you can have a relationship with a friend. But over a period of time, it takes a period of time of operating with that friend to be, for him to be worthy of believe, believing them. If they tell you something, they're going to do something, do they do it? Now, how many know God is faithful? Right? Totally, absolutely faithful. And even if somebody said, I don't think he was, they are anyway. He is anyway. They just don't understand some things. And here's the thing about it. We are learning to be faithful. Huh? The word means to be true. The word means to be just. The word means to be trustworthy. You know, Paul wrote to the church there at, uh, at young Timothy, and he said, Timothy, to, in the Greek, Timothy, to, to Timothy, my true son in the Lord, my proven son in the Lord. Timothy was somebody that over time Paul could trust. Other ones fell out. 
Other ones went to somewhere. You know, one, one guy went because he said the, the present, this present world was calling him, and he went off over here. Another guy went off over here. A lot of that. But Timothy was a faithful son. Amen? Amen? So it says, trustworthy. Now here's an interesting uh, part of this word that I thought was interesting. Um, observant and steadfast to one's word. In other words, they, they watch over what they say and, and the promises they make to make sure that they try to take care of that, right? Okay. Awesome. That's good. Now, everybody say faithful. You have to ask yourself a question. Can you be trusted? Now, we have Pastor Stella here. We have Pastor Melissa here, who've been with me a long time. Stella's been with me now 40 years. Okay, now, uh, Melissa, about half that time. And Melissa will tell you, because she's real good, she likes these kind of sermons because these things point out the things that really are going to help people. They're either going to make people or break it. Yeah. You know? And she'll tell you how many people come in, they get into the church, whatever church it is, right? And then they like the church, right? Wow, this is great. I really like this guy. I really like this gal. I really like this church, like whatever it is about it. And they begin to say things. And many times they say them way too soon. Things like, wow, this is great. You can count on me being here. Huh? Well, if you're not yet a trustworthy person or a faithful person, and you say something ding-dong like that, then what you're going to do because of your character is you're going to go along for a couple of weeks until you don't like whatever or you get lazy or somebody else, whatever the case, Satan comes to steal the word. And the next thing you know, they're not there anymore. Even though they promise you that they're going to come back and this is going to be their church. And we see it over and over and over and over and over again. So we know that there's not too many people that have the ability to be trusted in what they say. I don't know how many times I've had somebody say to me, I will call you, and they don't. Or say to me, I'll meet you at a certain time, and they don't. Or a lot of things. All of us have seen that. And it's amazing to me that some of the people that fall into that category are even spiritual leaders who have never learned really to be faithful to the things that God has called them to do. It's real easy to be faithful when you're comfortable. Like with me, I remember I was comfortable pastoring my church. I was comfortable having Holy Ghost blowouts in the church. And I was comfortable eventually traveling in America. But I didn't even want to think about going overseas. That gave me the creeps. <laughs> and then one day Oral Roberts came on there and started talking about, with Kenneth Copeland or something, started talking about this. And God got all over my case and he says, I want you to start going overseas. Well, that was uncomfortable, but I want to be faithful. So I dedicated myself to the Lord in that area. If you want me to go, I'll go. And doors opened up and I went and it wasn't like I thought it would be. Sometimes it was much better, sometimes worse. But the point is, we have to be faithful. You know, and I don't like this stuff that I see across the world. When I was sitting there the first time in Panama, I'm sitting in the motel room because that old boy called me on the telephone and he told me and my wife, I will be there and you have to be ready at 10 o'clock, let's say, 9 o'clock. So we're sitting there at 9 o'clock and 9 o'clock went past, 10 went past, and I'm thinking, what happened? Maybe his car broke down, this thing, that thing. And about 11 o'clock, you know, they come rolling up like, like it's no big deal. Oh, don't worry about it. Well, the service starts at 10. Oh, no, no. Wow. Well, it says 10. Well, that doesn't mean nothing. Wow. So we get in the car. We drive all the way over there, and everybody's sitting around. Nobody's doing anything. And it's, it's an hour after they said service starts. And finally, the service starts when they get good and ready. And they'll go all night. I wonder why people get burned out, <laughs> right? And this happened 
all the time, every time I was there. And you know, my wife, she knew I was getting real aggravated with these people. It's just because I, I teach this stuff and I know this stuff. And to me, that's just wicked. Then you get this. You get the pastor of the church and, you know, this is a big church. And he say, you got an hour. Oh, good. Okay. Got a whole hour. Then about halfway through the worship service, they come, you got, you got, a, you got 45 minutes. Then a little while longer, they come over and they go, got 30 minutes. Only got 30 minutes. Then it gets down to 20. You know, 20, I can't even get an introduction into 20. So I'm having to adjust. I felt like really strongly tempted to just walk out at that point. Just walk out and never come back. I, to me, it was horrible. To them, it was the way they do things. And you'll find that's all over overseas. There is no understanding of faithfulness or the importance of being on time. This is why they're third world nations. Come on. Who never, you know, advance because they don't have any of these skills to develop. Now, they may be very, very faithful in some ways. They may preach the gospel. They may be under persecution doing it. But these are the type of things you got to watch out for because it doesn't work good. This is why I say if we start at 10, we start at 10. Unless something, you know, like a tornado blows down something. Everybody say amen and starts at 10. So he says, be faithful and what? Wise. Not a wise guy like, like the mafia, but wise. That word means prudent, sensible. One who is practical. One who can be practical when dealing with other people. Actually, the word really means a people expert. Somebody who is faithful. You can trust them. They'll be on time. They'll do their job. They'll do what they said. They'll be there on time. And somebody who you can trust will work good with other people who's practical and prudent and understand some things about life. God wants both those for leaders. Leaders cannot be true leaders until you have both sides of those equations done. Th number one, three, three things, servanthood, faithfulness, and wisdom that way. Amen. Yes, that's right. A wise servant must be all those things. Trustworthy, practical, able to deal with others as God would have them deal with them. Those people that the Lord uh, wants to make rulers over his own house. Now let's move, move, read on because I've got ahead of myself a little bit. Okay, what, uh, where was I at here? What? 45. 45, okay. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom the Lord has made ruler of his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed, everybody say blessed. blessed. Of course, we know this means empowered to prosper. A lot of things. Blessed is the what? Servant. Not just the disciple or the person sitting in church. We're not talking about that right now. Blessed is a servant. A person who has decided to serve. Whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. We have a choice. We only got a certain amount of time. You make the choice. Verse 47. Truly I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. There's coming a time in our lives where, you know, you get, you get tested and you're, you're, you're going along and thinking, Lord, I'm not really have a whole lot of responsibility here. I'm doing the best I can. I'm serving you. I'm being faithful. I'm on time. I'm sweeping the floor. I'm cleaning the toilets. I'm doing whatever it is. And you, can't, you can't skip a, a step. It's not like you can jump up the ladder. You have to take it one step at a time. And when you finally get there, sometimes you're going, man, you know, I'm going along. But you see, God always has a time where he's going to exalt somebody into a place of more leadership. All right. And that's going to happen in your life over and over if you're faithful, more and more responsibility and so on and so forth. And then when Jesus comes back where you go home to be with the Lord, then you really... You have been faithful on this earth, faithful on this planet. 
You've done what was right. So God is going to reward you. Now, see, we, I happen to believe, believe in the millennial thousand year reign. Most Christians don't. They don't believe that. Yep. Most denominations don't. I know. But uh, what does that mean, right? Does that mean anything, really? But my Bible tells me that God, we're going to come back to the earth with the Lord, set up this kingdom, and we're going to rule and reign with him. So in other words, we will be rewarded according to our faithfulness with things in that realm for a thousand years, helping the Lord rule and reign. And he won't rule and reign like some of these politicians. There's still, there'll still be people that get out of line. Can you imagine that? I, it's amazing because they get out of line. They do. And finally, the devil even gets loosed again, and people follow the devil again. That, that goes to show you how depraved human beings really are. But you see, you can be like the nun. You can have a position in God's kingdom in the millennial. If somebody gets out of line, you can hit them with a ruler. Hallelujah. <laughs> Or go flick their ear. Amen. There's times where I'd like to flick an ear or two. Nowadays, they probably sue you. you. You flick my ear in church. All right. But there's rewards for faithfulness. There's rewards for servanthood. And there's rewards for being wise when you're doing it and staying that way. But... Verse 48, but, and if, now, when he says this, realize this gonna, there's going to be temptations to do this. He wouldn't bring this up if there wasn't going to be temptations to do this. But, and if that evil servant, everybody say evil servant. Now, here, now we got it. Now he's really getting meddling here. All of a sudden, now you got an evil servant. There's, here's a servant that God calls evil. Now, he's not necessarily calling the person evil, but his servanthood part. It's no good, man. Does that make sense? Because immediately somebody's going to go, now that's legalism and bondage and, uh, you know. No, it's the Bible. I'm not the one who wrote it, you know. I'm not the one who wrote this. Verily I send you that he shall make him ruler all, over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. You know what? I've been serving God all these years. I'm tired. How many have ever got tired? I do. I got up here and I was under such tremendous pressure in my life when I came up here. I mean, crazy people. I'm so sick and tired of crazy people. So I come up here and all my spiritual sons, except a few, and daughters turned on me. While I'm up here, maybe the bad guy stop sending support. And then I had a house there that I, I rented. I said I rented to uh, Christians and they, they they didn't pay their rent and they just left without telling us. And this happened over and over. So I'm paying two mortgages and we're living up Fish Creek and it's expensive up there to live a lot more than here. Amen. I'm under all this stress and strain and we're, we're having all this kind of stuff going on. And, you know, it's like, oh, my God, I'm just so tired of this. And the Lord said, six years you're going to go through this. And then the seventh year you'll come out of it, you know. I said, well, thank you, Jesus. And I'm going through all this and the pressure and it was I was tired. I was tired of people who would not say what they you know, do what they say and all that kind of stuff. And the next thing I know, we're down in the blue church and we went through that. Now, inside, I'm saying to the Lord, I'm tired. I've I'm, I'm, uh, I'm been battling these things for all these years. Can I drive a truck? For a while. Can I go do something else? I would like to try something else in life just for a season. But the Lord said no. He says you can't do that. Why? Because you're my servant. I need you. 
I need you here. I need you on, 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 on duty. Well, nobody comes to see me anyway, um, Lord. I get like 20 people, 30 people, you know, and I'm, I'm preaching to 20, 30 people up here and, you know, there's hardly anybody here and not a whole lot going on. But see, that's not the way, the way the Lord looks at things. He's saying, you're just going through some things. And, you know, then in, into that seventh year or so, everything changed. And, you know, I felt good again. I felt excited about the Lord. I'm excited about the things of God. And we're moving forward. But let's be honest. Everybody says some of these things in their hearts. Yeah, yeah. Lord, I've served you. And this is what happens to a lot of people. Lord, I've served you all my life. I'm tired. I'm just not going to go to church anymore. I'm going to sit. Yeah, well, we, we watch out for these things. I'm going to sit. I'll watch them on TV. Did a lot of people up north. You know, in Door County up there where we live, probably a lot more people that actually have been born again and even committed to, to being a servant in their life that don't go to church than do at this point. A lot more. In fact, we probably have 150, 200 people. I'm serious about this now. But you see, something got to them. They didn't read these scriptures. And if they did read them and they said, well, it doesn't, it doesn't relate to me. Well, it all relates to you. Everybody's called to serve. Right? So, verse 8, evil servants begin to say in their heart. Nobody can hear what I'm saying. Well, God hears. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, some of you single, since we got a couple of them here, some of you single ladies, we've got most of the people here, you single ladies, what you, one thing you have to watch out for is that guy that comes into your life that's got, you know, he's handsome, he's got dimples, <laughs> and the dimples aren't in his stomach. He's got that six pack. <laughs> he looks good, smells good, puts on good deodorant. <laughs> you, you, yes, uses mouthwash. Make sure he flosses his teeth. You like all those things. But what you got to watch out for sometimes is that you begin to think, you know, I've been, I've been single all these years. And I'm believing for a, for a husband. Well, we are. We're all believing for you too. But I've seen how how all of a sudden that person that you thought was going to be the one turns out to be a dud. And if you would have married that dud, you would have been far worse off than you are right now. In fact, Paul said, quite frankly, you're better off not being married. And some of these times, I think he's right. It's just getting to be crazy. Things don't turn around here with some of this, these things. You know, it's going to be tough, you know, tough sledding for us, which may be the best thing in the world. We don't know. You know, over there in China, they've been having an underground church for years. It's one of the strongest churches. You know what I'm saying? People in Russia. See, this is not like, you know, we're, it's not like we better ask God for his mercy. Because it's not like, you know, we're, we're so special. Now, I believe in America it's important. I don't think that's going to happen. But I'm just telling you, I didn't think they'd legalize uh, gay marriage so fast. You know, I all this stuff kind of just sneaks up on you, you know. Next thing you know, they'll be wanting to wed donkeys. People and donkeys and everything else. All kinds of stuff's going to happen. And it sneaks up on you. If we're not salt and light. We don't put a stop to it, right? So anyway, verse 49. Now the Lord's delay in his coming. I've been, I've been in the way for like 30 years. Well, most of the time you are in the way. Get out of the way and start getting in the way here. Right? Verse 39. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Now, here's where you get in trouble. You get tired. You get frustrated. You see how people are. 
even your fellow servants sometimes. So you finally just start going, you know what? I think I'm going to smite that fellow servant. And you begin to have an attitude that's not good and it gets worse. And you're not smiting them necessarily with your hands, but you're smiting them with your mouth. You know, and you're smiting them with your attitude. Yes. And that's exactly right. You want to preach? Sorry. Okay. Well, she was. That's a good point, though. Remember all you, where you came from, she says. Now, let me tell you something. Yeah, women are supposed to be quiet. Didn't you know that? <laughs> Boy, if we had to have, women had to be quiet in church, we wouldn't have much church. I'll tell you that right now. Man, I can see the Facebook start fading down to 4,994. 4, um, but the truth is that this is what, it doesn't happen overnight. This is a process people go through. And he warns us. He says, you're going to start thinking different in your heart. I just want to quit. I just want to retire. Now, I'm not saying that retirement's not, you know, that's okay for some. But you can't really think about it. If you're really a servant, if you can move and talk, God still wants to use you. You know? And you're not going to be happy doing anything else. Sitting around fishing, that's all right for a couple of days. Sitting on the beach, give it a week. Then after that, I'd rather go hang myself than sit on the beach. <laughs> but it says, and, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. Okay, so what's happening here? He's, he's switching over from his fellowship in church, going back with his old buddies and people in the world, becoming one of them because you see, man, they're having more fun. And, and this is, you know, I kind of forget, many people do that. And these people were ser servants at one time. They, ha they had the servant message. They were moving along. And then something began to happen. Huh? Well, that's not going to happen to me. Well, I've had a lot of people say that over the years. And guess what happened? They're now drinking with the drunkard. Verse 50. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in that hour that he is not aware of it, and cut him asunder. Now, that's kind of graphic. <laughs> and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Wow. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, you see, a lot of these scriptures just really are interesting to me. It's like, but you know, Pastor Tom, once saved, always saved. Well, what do you do with the last verse there? And people interpret these things different ways. They try to find a way to interpret it so that it fits into their, their idea. I don't ever do that. What I try to do is just say, this is what's said. You figure it out. None of that's good, though. I don't want to be cut asunder. And I don't want to be portioned with the hypocrites. Amen? Hallelujah. So, you have a choice. We have a choice. We're going to be tempted. There's going to be times where we're going to be tempted to go back. There's going to be times where... And everybody needs a rest. And, and you know, there's, nothing, there's something about some people that just, they don't get this. You don't fight all the time. If you're fighting all the time, there's something wrong. In war, you don't, they don't let you fight all the time. They'll send you out for a while, and when you're in an intense battle, they'll pull you back, sit you on a beach somewhere, and let you eat red meat and steaks and stuff. They do. That's what they do. Because you cannot, you continue, if you continue to battle intensely all the time, you'll crack and be no good. And it's the same spiritually speaking. So God will take you through an intense time, and then he'll back you off for a while. I remember up here, it wasn't good for me because I, I, I would go out and, Melissa, you know, you used to run there. Remember the, the trails up there in Fish Creek? You liked to run when you were in high school. And I would walk up in there and I would just walk around. Just look at the trees. It's a squirrel. 
Look at that squirrel, you know, and just relax. Just rest. You can't hear anything out there. It's peaceful. Every once in a while, you know, you might see a mama deer that you don't want to get around. You know, mama deers are meaner than sin. I didn't know that till I got up here. And let me tell you something. I saw a badger, my, own, my one and only badger while I'm walking out there. I go, I think I'll move the other way. But for the, for the most part, to me, it was therapy. I needed it because of the intensity of the Reno thing for a while. And so I got some good rest that way. I mean, they got trees, you got birds, you got water. It's beautiful. Where I was at, you got thorns and thistles. I'm here to tell you, you get up in the morning and you get one of those, um, I call them Kentucky kernels, goat heads in your feet. Oh, that's a terrible way to wake up. It's, it's like a needle right through your heel of your foot. Chunk, oh, you know. So I was enjoying that part. And God will take you and he'll rest you. But while I was resting doing all that, I was also pastoring and starting a church. Amen. I was still involved, but it wasn't as intense. He protected me. He, 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 he let me have my time to heal up over some things. Amen. All those things I was talking about, you know. A lot of those things were, were difficult and challenging. And so, we don't want to be smiting our fellow servants. Everybody say amen. Now, Go to, uh, we're here in Matthew tw uh, uh, 25. Are you there? So he's, he's actually talking about the way the kingdom of God works. You got to stop thinking about just the way America works or the way Sweden works or the way anybody, any, any, any of our nations work. That's all fine and good. But it's, we're in the kingdom. So how does the kingdom work? What does God require kingdom people to do? Well, it's very apparent here. He's looking for servants. And, you know, I love God's language in all of these things. It's like he lets you know where the rubber meets the road. Now, some people blow it off. Other people will see how important it is. And once you get to see how important it is, you begin to realize, my God, God is more interested in my development as a servant, then he has a whole lot of other things that I thought were important, you know. And then he comes to, to, to chapter 25. And this is, of course, a very important parable, right? And it relates to us today. It says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. I don't know where you find those nowadays, but maybe they're out there somewhere. Which, do, which took their lamps and went, went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, in those days, of course, they had these long, drawn-out wedding ceremonies. I tell you what, man, a lot of this, the Jewish wedding ceremony thing was really cool. There was a lot involved in all that. So these are virgins. They're waiting to get married. Okay, that's the whole thing. So here they are. There's ten of them. Everybody say ten of them. <clears throat> they took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 2. And five of them were what? Wow, you know these words keep coming up, don't they? Five of them were wise and five were idiots. That's what the word means in the Greek. They were morons. They did not see it coming. Verse 3. They that were foolish took their lamps and didn't take any oil with them. Now, you, that's pretty foolish. How can you use a lamp without oil? In those days, you, you couldn't. But they were so excited, for whatever reason, they jumped up, took them lamps, and they didn't take any oil. And how many know, praise God, oil represents the Holy Spirit? Oil represents the Holy Spirit, and there are people out here who just, for whatever reason, just keep resisting that. I just don't need those guys. You know, I went to Pastor Tom's church, and they, he talked about tongues, and that scared me, so I didn't go back. Well, you're one of those foolish virgins. You rejected the message that God has for you. 
So you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, they're nice people. Yeah, but they're foolish. Once you hear the truth about these things and you blow it off for whatever reason, you're foolish. It's crazy. In this day and age, you're trying to tell me you don't need the Holy Ghost. You don't, you don't need being able to pray in tongues. You, got, you can't. How are you going to live? How are you going to hear from God? How are you going to know? Get, get through all this stuff that happens. How are you going to have any joy in your life? Your Christianity will be dead and dry and boring. and you, You'll be over there saying, oh, God, please kill me. Get me out of here. There's a big difference between a spirit-filled Christian who has his lamps loaded up with oil and keeps them burning than other people. A huge difference. Somebody says, yeah, they're all nutty. Well, the reason we seem nutty is because we're just so excited about the thing. What makes you so excited, Pastor Tom? You're, you look like you're so sure about some of these things. I am sure about some of these things. Do you really believe that? No, I know it. Sometimes you can just know. You don't have to believe in one thing. No one's another. You know. Hallelujah. I know that my Redeemer lives. How do you know you're saved? You just know. Do you really believe that? No, I know it. I know that I know that I know. Man, when you've had the experiences I've had with God, it's hard not to know. It's hard not to know. Because I got oil. I got my oil in my lap. Keep me burning, burning. But we used to sing that song. That thing needs to be thrown out. That wasn't very good. Some of those songs, those are hokey songs. What's that one where you go, uh... There's one way to peace through the power of the cross. His banner over me, and you're all making these signs. I used to actually do that stuff. I go, I look back at that, and I go, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Some of these songs, I'm just kidding. But oil in my lamp, keep me burning, burning. Good song. You know, we got to have oil in our lamps. Yeah, <laughs> Say it out loud, oil. oil. Yeah. Everybody in the body of Christ needs to get oiled. Yeah. If you don't, you're going to have a hard time in this time. It's almost like God goes out of his way, chapter after chapter, to tell us this stuff. It's got to be hard for him to sit up there and go, you know, that one, I love them, but my God, they're just going to get beat up for no reason for this. Never have any victory or fun. The things of God are fun. If you're not having any fun in church and the things of God, there's something seriously wrong with you, and your Christianity is not real. Yeah, but I, the Bible says be sober-minded. Yeah, it does. But you just like, you know, look like you've been, you know, eating curtain rods. You're so sober-minded, you don't even realize that God is a real person who has feelings, who enjoys his kids, who likes to have a good time with them. Don't you like to have a good time with your kids? Do you like to have a good time with your, with, with your grandkid and throw them over your shoulder once in a while and, you know, hang them upside down like a bat? And I can't do that anymore. They're too big, you know. But you like, that's one of the great joys of life. God's like that. We're creating in his image and likeness. We know that just by who we are. Life is to be enjoyed. Some Christians, you can't do anything. It's like, you ever go out and swim? No, because if I, I had to wear a bathing suit, I can't, you know, I'm not going to not cover my body. Well, that's all right. Wear a durlap. Whatever you want to do. I mean, sometimes we take things too far. Now, I'm not for people, you know, not wearing too much clothes and everything. But on the other hand, you know, if you show an armpit or something, people aren't going to get too turned on by armpits, most of them. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, you know um, dressing in the winter and going swimming. Or, or playing baseball or basketball or football. It's joy. Joyful. It's, it's fun. It's happy. One of the things I missed the most this year was, in summer, was games. We all, we all went we, to see Gabby Ruth, you know, hit the ball. I didn't get to see that this year. It was frustrating because there's joy in that. As a Christian, 
to see people grow. Come on. But if you don't have any oil in your lap, there's no joy for you. It's boring. This is why some people backslide. I can't take it anymore. This is no fun, man. Everybody else is having fun, and I'm sitting over here. I can't even. I had one guy on Facebook the other day say, if you got a TV, you ain't even following the Holy Ghost. I go, I take TV and hit you with it. <laughs> if, you, if you're watching TV, you got a TV in your house, you're not listening to the Holy Ghost. How was he watching? Well, he wasn't watching. I'm just saying, though. What? Yeah, well, you got a computer? Yeah. You just post it on Facebook, you dummy. Well, see what I'm saying, though? It's like, come on, man. Well, I don't believe in TVs. Good. You, you leave that between you and God and leave the rest of us alone. You mean, Pastor Tom, do you watch movies sometimes? I enjoy some kinds of movies. Stella, she likes the ones where everything blows up. And, you know, I like a good thriller. I like where I don't, don't see it coming. Oh, my God. I didn't see that coming. I like books. Do you read novels, secular novels? Yes. <gasps> Pastor Tom, there might be a word or two in there. Well, you know what? All you got to do is go to the restaurant and hear those words. How many understand that we have to have some joy in our lives? Christianity is not some kind of medieval weirdness. You know, I don't know where people get the ideas of that. And I think that that's what's wrong with the world. The world views us as, as that, you know. And you just hang around me for a while, you'll find out I like to have fun. I went over there, you know. We were over there for Thanksgiving at, at her house. They, I told Melissa, I said, now I want a turkey. They started this stuff this year. They started, well, let's have turkey meatballs. I go, what? <laughs> no. I go, now, wait a second. Turkey what? Tell me that again. Meatballs made of turkey. Turkey meatballs. And I go, now, that's okay, but not on Thanksgiving. I have traditions. I got things that, that I have to have. I, gotta ha I don't have to have it all the time, but I got to have my bird. Yeah, but they may be expensive. At the time, we thought they may be like 50 bucks. I said, I'll pay 50 bucks or 100 bucks. I'll shoot one. Let's just have a turkey. <laughs> I got plenty of them in the backyard I can shoot. So I told Melissa, well, finally, when we set it up, you know, because we, we went through that corona thing and we didn't, weren't sure we were all going to make it. We did, though. And I, and, and, and I said, now, Melissa... I said, one thing, Jennifer, one thing I'm going to tell you, we want lots of gravy. Lots. Of, I said, I want lots of gravy. I want gravy on everything. I want to cover the turkey with gravy. I want to cover the mashed potatoes with gravy. I want to cover the vegetables with gravy. I want you to be, just put a big thing of gravy and sit it next to me because that's what I want. I had this craving, gravy. And we had gravy. And I had a great big turkey leg. And I had gravy. And I wasn't convicted about it being bad. I enjoyed every second of eating that turkey. Come on. Amen. That's right, because I enjoy life. Why? Because I got my oil, honey. Well, if you had the oil, you wouldn't be eating so much gravy. <laughs> Verse 2, five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out and meet him. This is what's going to happen. This is what's happening right now. Huh? Verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. 
And the foolish said unto the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. How come you didn't get oil before? You had all these opportunities to get oiled up, but you just spent them by. You blew them off. You heard the preacher. You heard it over and over. What important to you? Well, we don't need the gifts of the Spirit in operation in this day and age. We don't need that tongue stuff. That's just gibberish and foolishness. That's just silly. Why will we need that? For God's sakes, not everybody's supposed to have tongues anyway. I mean, they go on and on and on. Get some oil in your lamp. Preachers need oil in their lamps. Amen? He goes, well, you know, at midnight there was a cry made. You know, the cry's going out right now. We're at that midnight hour and there's a cry going out right now. Boy, I tell you what, you better start getting on. Look, you got a little bit of time to get all this stuff in order. I was telling my wife the other day, she goes, I said, now we're in the middle of December, right? Almost. I said, now we got 10 weeks and March will be here. I said, that'll fly by. She goes, well, that's a long time. I go, not for me, it isn't. I look up and 10 weeks, it went like that. I mean, we're going right through, right through um, so fast. Uh, winter already. I go, wow, man, that's so cool. But you see, that's why, because at my age, you see, all of a sudden, time seems like it speeds up. It's like when I was a little boy and summer would come, it seemed like forever we had summer. Oh, we don't have to go back to school, you know. It's wonderful. Remember that? Play and play and swim and have fun. And then finally we go to school. Ah, school's in. And you go through school and you get out. But today, they're all mixed up. There really doesn't seem to be much difference between summer and winter because you're moving so fast. You know? Does that make sense? And you were headed toward that. We're headed toward that, 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 that midnight hour. It's not time to mess around anymore. Seemed like the other day I was getting my license for my car, 16 years old. Does not seem that long ago. And yet here I am now they call me a senior citizen at 65, which I think is kind of idiotic. What does that mean? But you know, 65. All of a sudden now, I'm going, wow, 65 years I've been on planet Earth. Man, didn't seem that long. It's like the Bible says, you're like a plant. Here you are one day, you're gone the next. So we have to take advantage of this stuff. You don't want to waste your time. People who come out here Saturdays are hopefully you're not wasting your time listening to me. But I'm just saying people who come out to, to, to listen are smart and wise. Because we need this, don't we? The foolish said to the wise, it's always going to be the way it is. The foolish are always going to say to the wise. A lot of questions. Well, give me some of your, why didn't you do that back when you were 20 years old? Why did you wait till you're 50, 60 years old, right? You knew about it, could have been involved in it, but you just sat there and didn't do anything while the rest of us did. And now you're wanting us to give you what we already got, what we worked to get. <coughs> Verse eight, and the foolish said unto the wise, <coughs> Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But you go, rather, to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, in other words, hey, we see this. We, we, we see we really need this. And while, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went with him, to the marriage and the door was shut. Mm -hmm. Whew. Afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open the door. But he answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I knew you not. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day and the hour when the Lord comes. Now what's he saying here to us? Well, there's a lot of things. But one of the things he's saying is we can't afford 
to just kind of float. So many, many folks floating through life, floating through this, floating through that, don't want to get up in the morning, don't want to go to work, don't want to go to church, don't want to do anything. You can't be like that. You've got to, praise God, reach deep down inside and say to yourself, I am going to be a wise and faithful servant. Every day. For the rest of your life. You don't want to get caught up like a foolish virgin. You don't want to get caught up drinking with the drunkards and all that kind of stuff. You don't want to get caught up running back with your old friends because you, you think it's more fun than Christianity because you had a hard week. You don't want to do that. And God warns us over and over. And here he says, I'm shutting the door on these people. Once the door is shut, it's shut. One of the things that I've always appreciated about the Lord is that he tells it the way it is. And by the way, it's like that with heaven and hell. People don't believe in hell. Oh, there's all kinds of doctrines. You can get out of hell easy now. Go to the right church. You know, well, that's all. That's your, you're going to burn for a while and then they let you loose, you know. Well, no, it says eternal fire. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that in the Greek. Yes, it does. Here's the thing about it, you know. God set it up that way, not for, for you, but the devil and his angels. But if you want to go there, you're going to go there. And when you die, your spirit, if it's not born again, will be drawn there. Just like a magnet. Nothing you're going to be able to do. Going to suck you right down there. A big demon's going to be waiting for you. You're going to be screaming and yelling and crying out to God, and he's not going to hear you because the door is shut. And you're going to be going down, 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 and you're going to realize that you're never getting out, and you're going to realize <clears throat> that you deserve everything you're going to get. Now, if you're wise and you're serving God and you're, you're doing what's right, all of a sudden your heart stops, or... Lori walks out and there's, turns around the, and she reads Mac on the truck, you know. <laughs> Something happens. Uh, Mac, Mac, you know, like a cartoon. Um, but whatever happens, Jesus comes back or, or you pass for whatever reason. You go, you're, you're, you're born again. You, 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 all of a sudden you turn around, there's some angels standing there. And your, your spirit's drawn you're like a magnet. They escort you all the way into heaven. Can't help it. You're just going to go. That's all. You get up in there. And on the way up, you're going to know this. I'm going to be there forever. Everything's changing. All my dreams have come true. This is greater than anything in the world. As in the world, yeah, all of a sudden you're losing. You're, you're, you're realizing the glories of heaven. And you're leaving behind this mundane place. And when you get there, every time you stop and look around, you shout and you're in ecstasy about what you're seeing. You're there forever and ever and ever. And you're going to be with Jesus in this wonderful place with the saints of God. And it's never going to end. Amen. If he moves locations, you'll just go with him for a while. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the way it's going to be for every human being on this earth. You don't want to be foolish. You don't want to get there halfway and then all of a sudden decide to deviate and go back the other way. Whew. Stand before the Lord and see, have him say, well done. Thou what? Good and what? Faithful servant. You don't want them saying, well, you got in by the hair of your chinny chin chin, grab a broom, you're on janitorial duty in heaven, better than, than not getting there, but that's not what you want to hear. You want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful. Amen. Amen. You guys get anything out of that? Yeah, it's not just being a servant. It's being found a 
faithful and wise servant. That's the next step. So ask the Lord to make you faithful. Boy, I tell you what, you pray that prayer, you're in trouble. Because he'll test you. How many know God tests us? He does. Not like the devil. It's not an evil thing, but God will test you. He'll, he'll go. You know why he tests us? Not because he needs to know what we're going to do, because he knows. So we know. I don't know how many times I've committed to something I thought to myself, I really wish I wouldn't have done that. But because I committed to it, I got to finish it. Amen? I got to finish this thing. We got to finish this thing. You guys that are called to be with me, got to finish it with me. Boy, you need to get a t-shirt. We survived. Another sermon by Tom. You know what? Mine aren't so bad. Melissa's are tough. I was listening to Melissa the other day and I go, man, I'm convicted. I think I need to repent and be baptized again. Make sure I'm going to get in. Yes, indeed. Well, this has been enthusiastic and fantastic. And, but I'm glad all of you could come out. There's a few of you. We're going to go ahead and receive our offering right now. I don't need to preach a long lesson about that. But if you're out there in, in uh, Internet land, you can go down. There'll be a link. You can give by PayPal, or you can go to our website link down there, and you can go to faithalivefellowship.org. Send us money. Become a partner with us. We'd appreciate it. Hallelujah. How many here would rather be here than in jail? This is what you call preaching uphill today. It was good for you, but I was having to climb up a hill. It's all right, though. I'm used to it. Stretch forth your hands. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the opportunity we have to give. We ask you to use this message, use this, these offerings for your glory. Reach out all over America and around the world. Let us bear fruit the next few weeks. Let us come into the greatest time in history. And we thank you, Lord. We accept. We accept, Lord God, everything that you give us to do. In Jesus' name and all God's people said amen. All right. We got a whole hour so you can mess around and talk. Or... You know, they were saying that it was supposed to be snowing real hard right now. We don't have any snow at all that I can see out.